Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com or also on BitChute and YouTube. And I have four other podcasts, the Awakening Podcast, the Meditation Podcast, Learn Polish Podcast, and the Crypto Podcast, and all can be found on ycon.com. I'm also a podcasting coach, so if you'd like to start on that, just you'll find the links in that as well. Today, my guest, Brendan Kumarasamy. I'm bringing him back because the last time we had a fantastic conversation, it was episode number 142, and we delved deeply into the YouTube. So if you're interested in YouTube, go back to that. Welcome back, Brendan. Hey, it's great to be here, Roy. Thanks for having me back. So I was uh, looking at a few more of your YouTube videos, and I see you've gone up, and I don't know, was it like six weeks ago or something like that, that we... It's gone up over 3,000, so it's going, uh, it's going in the right direction. Something's working, that's for sure. <laughs> but, but you had mentioned, actually, the first 10,000 took, uh, I don't know, something like two, and then it just doubled in seven months. And I'm noticing that on my own, because I started putting all my stuff onto the Roy Collin one, because I have each channel, and some of them, they get very little. The Polish one works well, but they're, they're kind of hit and miss. But my own ones, when I'm putting everything on it, it's I'm getting like 30 and 40 new uh, subscribers a week. Like, so that wasn't happening before. So I think it'll eventually, hopefully, you know, start getting in the same direction as your own one. Absolutely. I mean, you're crushing in the podcasting space. So you're, you're definitely doing well. I have to learn a lot more from you. So we're all learning from each other. So like I highly encourage people to go in because a lot of the things that I'm going to talk to today, I've actually seen you discuss them on your videos. And I, there, there was ones that just like I like, the one, for example, one today that I was looking at three lessons from the coffee shop for presentations. You might just talk about it. That was a decent one. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the coffee shop was interesting. You, you know, the principle in general behind those three lessons videos, Roy, is I'm always trying to, especially since it's a speaking related podcast, I'm always trying to push myself out of my communication comfort zone. So eventually, I'm, and I'm sure a lot of people who come on your show talk about the same thing, right? Filler words, pausing, right? Eventually, you run out of things to say. But for me, since my goal is to create an encyclopedia of communication knowledge, I'm always trying to create wacky things. You have uh, videos on the channel, but like three lessons I learned from rapping. I have three lessons I learned from water. Like I always try and like figure out different analogies to make it easier for people to digest communication. And in that example with the coffee shop, I don't remember all the points to be honest, but I do remember one of them being having the same presence in a presentation as we do when we're having coffee with an old friend. So when we're having that conversation, we're not trying to rush it. We're not trying to run away from it. And what we do that with our presentations, we try and get into this presentation. We try and run quickly towards it so that we can sprint right out of that room. But when we start to compare the old coffee with a friend with presentations, we start to really relax and enjoy that moment that we have with that audience. Yeah, excellent. And there's ones as well because you kind of like analyze other speakers so like uh, Patrick Bet David or David Bet and that like I've read his book he's actually I, I, I like him and most of the people that you're actually uh, analyzing they're actually all top people and you know they're people that uh, you know you aspire to be and it's nice the way that you're doing it so you might I don't know do you remember that one but one of the ones and, and your reasoning behind it as well yeah, absolutely. And, and the reason, by the way, the, for so people know this, the reason why sometimes my memory is foggy is I actually write up my content years in advance. So for something that's coming out today, let's say as of recording this 2022, I actually wrote it in 2020. So I'm currently writing 2024. And the reason is because consistency is so important on YouTube. So that's why I tend to I write it. But the, the other piece around the, the analyzed speakers, I felt what was missing in, in that space, especially on YouTube, was a very detailed breakdown of a speaker style. Because most people, what they do is they generally just react. So let's say Patrick's giving a speech, right? I love the next five books as well. I've read it. It's a great book. And, you know, they just go, okay, he's speaking. They, go, they, they, they just give reactions. Whereas my style is a bit different. I actually watch a whole keynote. And I really sit down. And I write out a whole detailed analysis of that person. So I really get to the core of what makes them unique as a speaker. And for example, with Patrick but David, there's a lot of things he does right, but I would say the, the things I comment on, which are more unique to him, is that he's, he's, he's like an actor. 
So he's explaining a topic in a video and then he starts pretending to be his mom or to be his sister or to be an audience. It's actually kind of bizarre if you're watching him the first time where he, he would say something like this. Well, I'm sure your mom is thinking right now, oh, what about this? And you're kind of just like, what's happening? Like, what's he doing? And, and it actually is very clear. I like the way that he doesn't have any fear around that because he just believes that's the easiest way to explain an idea. And he has just literal anxiety of writing. He just goes into it. So that's what's very unique about his speaking style. He just reacts and role plays people who are watching his show in real time. And he also, like, he'll tell you his flaws as well, whereas a lot of the speakers don't. And I think that's why people connect to him, because there's nobody perfect. And when he says, you know, whether he's talking about his wife or whatever, saying that it's not easy, you know, being married, he'll actually say it as it is. <laughs> and I, you have to admire him for that. Oh, yeah, I completely agree, especially given his position, right? So people understand this. For those who don't know who PBD is, he's a CEO of a $100 million company. Like he has a lot of scrutiny and lots of stakeholders to manage. Yet he's on a podcast and he's going, yeah, marriage is not easy. I always tell my wife every year, babe, we got it. We got to keep good, looking good for each other. <laughs> it's, I, I, I love I love his uh, his openness. And I try I try and be the same way in any conversation, uh, every video I make. So, yeah, it's, it's very funny. Yeah, so like I know you're doing the coaching, but when you're actually uh, I'm assuming you do workshops as well for. So you may just tell us about that, how you're preparing and, you know, structuring yourself. Yeah, for sure. So definitely, I would say coaching and workshops is very two different things. And the reason they're different is because in coaching, you're really delivering the same result for a different group of people. Right. So in coaching, it's like, OK, this person's a CEO, this person's an executive, but there's the same principles that you apply over and over and over again. Workshops are similar. But depending on the type of experience you're creating, everything changes. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you take two types of workshops. One of them that I give is like a corporate one where let's say a big insurance company says, I need you to present to my intern. Here's some money. Just present what you do every year. So that one, I don't really prepare that much. It's the same presentation. We've already talked with the stakeholder. They just want you to give the same thing over and over again. So for those presentations, it's really being really good at duplication. Do the puzzle method, like we talked about, just recap. Start with the edges first of the workshop, practice the edges out, make sure it's really good so people are really engaged, and then work out the middle. But in other types of experiences, people are more open. So I'll give you an example. I presented to my clients in Florida a few weeks ago, and that was a brand new workshop that I spent two and a half months preparing because they've already seen all my stuff. So I wanted to find a way to wow them. A way. And what I did in that two-hour workshop is I extracted what I call their communication why. Why is it a must for them to work on their communication skills? So I created a whole workshop around that with personal stories and all that stuff. And that was very complicated. So for those types of workshops, I think are more interesting for your audience. What goes through my mind is a couple of things. The first one is what is the one thing I want them to leave with and implement at the end of this two-hour experience? And then the second one is what weapons am I going to use in my arsenal? Analogies, quotes, personal stories, exercises, ease of use, audience mastery to get them to that key outcome. And the third one is a process I called inspect. So inspect means you try out some of these ideas on a small audience and you see how they react to them. And based on your reaction, you see what works and what doesn't, and you can adjust in real time. So that's generally the approach I take with workshops. Excellent. And like, especially if you're going into a corporation, sometimes people are told, hey, you have to go into this uh, workshop and people are not engaged in it. Like, what's what's your tricks for that? Yeah, I would say for that specific scenario, it's kind of like a stand up comedian, right, Roy, in the sense that when they go to the Netflix special, the reason the set lands is because they already messed up with all the other jokes before. And they see the joke that works 10 times in a row. And that's what they put in the special. So it's the same thing with workshops, whether it's corporate or anything else. There's something that works uh, that you try and that there's something that doesn't work. And the key is to always take the lessons learned that works onto the next workshop. So I'll give you a few examples that's worked for me that won't necessarily work for everyone. So I'd say one of them is make the session extraordinarily interactive, especially if the group's small, which is generally the case for me in corporate. That's why they pay me the big bucks. It's because the group's small, their executives are, right? So if there's like 12 people on the call, I'm spending 10 minutes going like, okay, I want everyone to tell me who you are, tell me what your role is in the company and what's your favorite flavor of ice cream. 
or something like that. So it like disturbs them. They're like, wait, what? And then and then it's like boom, boom, boom. So I actually talk very little in the speaking workshop. I have them talking. That's the first piece. I think a lot of speakers spend too much time talking rather than letting them talk. Uh, second technique I use is I pause the workshop every 25 minutes and I go, hey, I just want everyone to reflect right now. Take two minutes and just go, what are the three lessons that you've learned so far? What's one takeaway that you got so far? And I, I just and I just keep my mouth shut for two minutes and they just write. And then I go, okay, John, go. What do you think? Boom, boom, boom. And that's one technique. I'm just, I'm just brain dumping a bunch of them. <laughs> a third one is I yell out different people's names. So I go, so let's say there's 10 people. I would say something like this. Okay, Roy, John, Julia, Aaron, I see you, Aaron, and Judy. I want all of you right now to reflect on this question. So I, I call out all of their names. So everyone's like, oh. So they keep getting like reawakened, especially in a virtual call, which, which is most of my speaking engagements because I don't want to travel or else I have to charge too much money for them to, to bear the cost. So, so yeah, so that's what I'm doing is always yelling out the different names. That's another one. And then one other one, of course, is having them say something in the chat, but also calling out what they say in the chat. A lot of people say to write something in the chat and they don't call it out. So let's say Julia says, I want to work on communication because it's important for my career. I would say, Julie, I love the fact that you're working on your corporate career. Boom. So I would read out the chat and I would have the chat in a separate uh, screen on my computer. So there's a couple of tips. Take, take one that you like and implement. Yeah, and because I was actually going to ask you that about the setup. So you've got two screens, one with all your kind of chat. And, and do you find that it can uh, disturb you at times or to take you off track? if people are engaging will you will you call them out on it if you see there's a conversation going on especially when it's a bigger group when it's smaller they tend not to do that but if you're in a you know a large group that can happen yeah i think with virtual it's tougher right right because if there's 100 people you can't control all 100 right i think the approach i like to use is kind of my advice right that's easy to implement for people is if your goal is to be a speaker Regardless of whether you're getting paid to speak or not, you should be delivering workshops every two weeks. I'll explain what I mean. Even for me at my level, right, I do a free training every two weeks. And the reason I do is to stay sharp. But the other piece is it allows me to consistently practice, right? So for everyone who's listening, whether your topic is communication, whether your topic is health, it doesn't matter. You want to practice giving that same workshop. The reason I'm so proficient on two screens is not because I'm special, Right? It's because I just have done the same workshop like 70 times. So I know how to navigate those two screens. So that's what I would encourage people to think about is a lot of people don't realize that the best way to speak is to speak. I know it's like not I know it's rocket science, but like it's it's what it is. So we need to spend more time focusing on one topic that we're really passionate about. And spending our time really being a mad scientist around how we can do that. I'll give an example. There's this one joke I, I tell in every single training, boy, literally every single training I do. And the joke is this. Okay, I'm going to pick three people to type share in the channel. I'll coach you for free. Don't worry. I won't be asking for your credit card numbers today. You're, you're safe. Don't worry. It's all good. So everyone always laughs at that joke. But I say that joke twice a week. <laughs> like every time by the way guys i won't be asking for your credit card number say just type sure don't worry i'll coach you for free on this call and people always laugh and so i always use it all the time excellent excellent yeah. i i know that there was uh, one of the other videos that that i looked at and i think it's very relevant it was kind of practicing alone because there's a lot of people especially if they just want to make the jump you know from, from the start you know, perhaps they don't want to do it in front of the family because I remember when I was doing it first, my mother just broke down laughing. And I, to, I, <laughs> I, I, it was actually when I was being a best man speech, that was going back before I actually get, got out of my comfort zone. And I went to my grandmother and my grandmother says, why are you hopping like that? <laughs> so I was shuffling on my feet and thankfully yeah, I was able to just, but I, I know that a lot of people, you know, perhaps they're living alone or something like that and they want to get started. So, you know, you, you discussed that in one of your videos as well. And it was actually good. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Roy. You know, the reason I, I brought up that video, I created that is because I'm a big fan of this question I got from Beryl Sullivan. And the question was, cause I'm more of a tough love type of guest. And I'm sure you've realized that is, are we making an excuse to do the thing or not do the thing? So a lot of us, when we're listening to a podcast episode, we're listening to tips, 
we either make an excuse to not do the thing. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I have kids. I don't want to do this. Or they make an excuse to do the thing. I have kids. I'm busy, but I'll block out five minutes tomorrow. Not like five hours. I'll block. Okay. I'm busy. I'll, I'll do the, I'll do an exercise like twice. So, so there's two types of people. So always ask yourself, which type of person are you being right now? Not just in communication, but in every area of your life. So the public speaking alone video came out because a lot of people said, well, I'm alone. I don't have friends. I was like, okay, well, here, here's three. I was like, how do you, how's that even possible? Just join a Toastmaster. It's like a hundred bucks. You don't even need a coach unless you're willing to pay the big bucks for one. But as, the point is, when it comes to speaking alone, there's three easy exercises you could do without any supervision. Literally none just to practice. Number one is do the random word exercise alone. Like just like, just look at the sky and go, you're alone in your basement. Nobody's watching you. Look at drawer, look at lights, look at light bulb and just do the random word exercise. Simple. That's the first one. Do that three times a day. It'll take you three minutes. No one's going to watch you. I don't, and by the way, this is a point I want to drive because then people go, remember, they always make an excuse not to do the thing. They go, oh my God, but what if I don't get feedback? And this is what I always reply with. You don't get rewarded for doing it well. You get rewarded for doing it a lot. So I'll repeat this again. You do not get rewarded for doing something well in speaking. You get rewarded for doing something a lot. Think about you. The reason why you're so great at podcast hosting is because you got like 50,000 podcasts. You're like, <laughs> you got like you know, the speaking podcast, you got the cooking podcast, you got the <laughs> eating podcast, you got the Poland podcast. You got... So because of that, and by the way, they're all successful. I was looking them up on listen notes. I was like, shit, man. He's like the only guy I know who has like seven podcasts and they're all like 0.5% top or something. So you're crushing it, which congratulations on that. But the point I want to drive is, you just woke up one day, you're like, oh, they're like, there's no meditation podcast. <laughs> you just started doing it. So, so that's the point, right? So that's number one. Do the random word exercise. And I always want to drive this. Very few people in their life do it 100 times. But it doesn't take a long time to do it 100 times. It takes like two hours out of your life. So give me two hours. That's the first one. Second one is called the question drill. So the question drill exercise is if you're guessing on a podcast, people are going to ask questions. If you're asking a lot of questions, if you're in a boardroom, a lot of the times when we get asked a question, we're nervous. We don't know the answer sometimes. So instead of being worried, wake up every day for five minutes and ask yourself for a presentation, a podcast you're guessing on. What's one question Roy's going to ask me today that I can reflect on? Oh, he's probably going to ask me about one of my videos. Let me write an answer to that question. But if you do that every day, Roy, you'll have answered 365 questions. It'll make your ability of asking, receiving questions so much better. That's exercise number two. And finally, exercise number three that doesn't require anyone else is, drum roll, please, send. <laughs> there you go. I love that you did that. It, it's just send five video messages. Actually, let me make it easier. Send one video message about somebody that you appreciated in your life. Like, I want all of you, I encourage all of you, okay? I want all of you to open up Roy's Instagram page. I want all of you to send him a voice note to just say, how has this podcast impacted your life? Wow, Roy, I've been watching your show and I, my English is my second language. Polish is my first one. I'm struggling, but I watched your podcast and it gave me the, con uh, sorry, I listened to the podcast and it gave me confidence. Just want to thank you. Send a voice note. Nobody does it. Right now, I know he's going to get a flood of voice notes. But that's the point. Like, it doesn't require any supervision. Do that every single day. People don't get appreciated. Do that. It'll change their life and it'll change yours. And I've got a few that uh, people have. Let, and it is. It's a nice feeling when somebody just leaves a voice message and they're saying how long they're listening and what it has done from. It's, it is a lovely feeling, to be honest with you. Right. But let me ask you a follow-up question, Roy. How many voice notes have you received in the last 30 days? Sure, a few. Right, less than 10, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, less probably like five. But your audience is massive. That's the point I want to drive. It's like, notice team. The reason I bring that up is also to, to shine you because you're doing amazing work. But the other piece is, like, think about this team. For those of you who are listening to this, Roy got probably five or six voice messages in the last 30 days. But there's like thousands of people listening to the show. I don't know the exact number, but it doesn't matter. Let's see that ratio. It, and this is a principle, I don't know if we covered last time, but I'll say it, say it now. 
if you communicate 20% better than your competition, you will stand out 100% of the time. Roy probably remembers those five people or a little bit more of the people who sent that voice note versus everyone else. So be, and it doesn't take a lot to be in that small percentile of people. And just on the podcasting, actually, because you know you're 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 going on different shows. I mean, you're sharing a lot of brilliant information, and obviously for yourself, it can lead to either coaching clients or even people to go to your uh, YouTube channel because somebody likes it. And you have a lovely way of actually saying, "Hey, if you know somebody like like say the one with the speaking alone, if you if you've anybody that, that that's <laughs> alone, but but you should be their friend." It was you know like you're putting the humor and the quirkiness, but like with with the podcasting you know like you, you go on uh, i don't know how many shows you 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 go on but i mean i've been on a few different ones as well like and you know like impact there's sometimes people they they don't even kind of know what you do they're kind of asking you beforehand and there's other times where a person can just talk away without really having a, a question and then the person is kind of guessing i just kind of curious of the different things that you've experienced while you've been on different shows i mean me and you are both tried veterans in this space i i guessed probably on 15 shows a week wow. with all of the inbound i get now things are getting a bit crazy i'll, I'll always make time for you Roy, because you're awesome <laughs> but yeah like it's crazy i mean with pod match and everything now it's like yeah it's wild but yeah you're right 90 98 percent of all the shows i've been on are not very good and the reason is because they don't have any background on you they don't ask really interesting questions. They're kind of just sitting there and going and talking about themselves a lot, actually. I think that's a, a big mistake, which you don't do, by the way. You're excellent. But but that's the that's the point I would drive. The other piece that, that I would think about is how do you become a better podcast host and a better podcast guest? So And it's super simple. I'll keep it simple. The best way to be a better podcast host that a lot of hosts don't think about is think about the pre-show experience. Lewis House talks a lot about this. He says the pre-show is the show. So the best podcast I've ever been on, it wasn't about the show. It was because he was so excited to be like, we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this. And he got me super hyped up that when I got on the show, I was like, oh, like I literally canceled all my other interviews that day. Like I rescheduled a bunch of them, like seven. So I could just focus all of my energy on that one. So the pre-show is the show. So start thinking about that. And then the other piece is asking questions that the person hasn't been asked before. That I feel is, is helpful as well. Those are just a couple of tidbits. The other piece is on the guest. So the guest, what I would say is a bit different than most. I wouldn't say like remove your filler words, all that stuff. I'm big on principle. So for me, what I always think about as a podcast guest right now on a show is going back to Chris Doe's definition of value, which I love. Chris Doe's the CEO of the future. He has a massive YouTube channel on creatives. And what he says, what I love is, the definition of value is tell me something I don't already know. So every time I'm thinking about knowledge that I want to share on a podcast, I'm not just sharing what I think right away. I'm prioritizing all of the information in my brain to only say things that no other guest on your podcast has said. So there's a prioritization that is being done in the information in my head. So whenever you're guessing on a show, you always want to ask yourself, not how can I get on somebody's show? That's the wrong question. The right question is, how can I be the best podcast guest in my industry? So out of every communication coach on the planet, how do I train myself to be the best podcast guest for that topic out of everyone? And if your focus is there, not on getting on a bunch of shows, you'll get the big names. Everyone eventually call you, right? And that's really the focus is how do you focus your mind around those things. Last thing that you asked me around, Roy, is how do you ask people to share content in a way that's tacky and fun? I'll be honest when I say that I didn't make this up. The credit goes to my producer. I have a producer for my YouTube channel. He's the one who thought about that. So when I did the public speaking thing, I used to always say, if you know one person who's X, share them, and they'll be one step closer to mastering their talk. And then Danny looked at me, and he was, Danny's my creative director. And he was like, how about we make this more fun? How about you say something like, if you don't have any friends, like, uh, why don't you share this? And I started laughing my ass off. And I was like, this is good. And I think, and it's interesting that you asked me this, because you're right, a lot of people don't do this. So the way I would think about it is try and make it more tacky. 
And there's different approaches that I'm probably going to test in the future, but I think they're easier to do on podcasts is tell a personal story around sharing the episode. So I'll give you an example. So a lot of podcast hosts just do this. Uh, if you know somebody, uh, just share it with them. Whereas what I would do if I was a podcast host, I would say something like this. Hey, I want to tell you about a story about Julia. So Julia is, is a seven-year-old girl, and she tuned into a pot, into our podcast recently, let's say the Speaking Podcast. And uh, she loved episode 200, and she started a business. But the reason that Julia found out about the podcast was because her friend Chris, who was like her dad or something, shared it with her. And that's really the power of sharing. It's not just about growing the show, guys. It's about creating an impact. So I'd love to ask you, who's that one person in your life that really could use this information, that could start a business, that could start that lemonade stand, that could go and speak in front of our classroom? I'd love for all of you to share and tell me those stories. Send me those stories so that I can feature on the next episode of Speaking Podcast. Now, that is a hook. Absolutely, yeah. No, that's brilliant. And as you said, that's the way most people say it, the first way that you were mentioning. Like, it's just, and like, because normally, like, I, I get a lot of requests on uh, on all the shows, but with, with the crypto one, I had organized a, you know, like say 10, and I got let down by a lot of people. And I kind of, I kind of stepped back and then I, I resurrected it. So I started reaching out to people, something I don't have to do for ages. And it's just like some, you know, somebody I go, oh, he'd be very good for it. But normally I'm, I'm just bombarded with requests to come on the show. And then, you know, I, I look at what they're trying to do. And you know, when someone's trying to promote themselves more than, you know, the message is important, you know, because even like, you know, you've been on before and even now it's all about all sharing all the stuff, you know, you, you haven't been pitching anything, but there has been times where, where people do that. But I've actually got 100% actually success rate with the people that i re reached out to and i've, I've read it's like you get different figures between 10 and 20 percent that there's a lot of rejections and i just like wondering uh, what way you do because i i'm sure that you you're you're not in the 10 or 20 percent they say you're well up there with actually getting on shows i'm just uh, curious what's your style for actually writing to somebody to make sure and I, i'll give it an example somebody that was on my show their PA or somebody sent an email the other day and CC'd about 30 podcasters and basically said, hey, they'd like to be on your show. And I, I just wrote her and I said, you know, that, that's not going to get you on any shows. And she was like, oh, I, I know. I thought she BCC'd it. But even to BCC it, that's not how you do it either. Like you make it specific to the, you know, the show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, it's cringeworthy, like. Yeah, I'll be honest when I say uh, I have an answer, but yes, my life is a lot easier than it used to be because I have a very credible YouTube channel now, so it's not hard to get booked on shows now. But, but yes, I, I will talk about my early days. That was a struggle. Here's a couple of things that I would say, Roy. I would say the biggest mistake podcasters, uh, sorry, no, people who want to guest on shows make and when their pitches is they don't add value in the pitch. So I'll give an example. And I know you saw this when I sent you a message a long time ago. I think it was like, it feels like I've known you for years at this point, honestly, <laughs> with the way that we edit this movie and energy thing. So what, what I do, even if you don't have a YouTube channel, by the way, I highly recommend, because a lot of people don't do this in the space, that you pitch with a YouTube video. And the reason I recommend this is very simple is a lot of us don't think of ourselves in the mind of the host. Let's say a host, especially you, is probably getting like 15, 20 pitches a day, probably. When you're getting pitched all of the time, you're always getting pitched with podcast episodes that people did an interview on. It's always like, oh, I was the guest on this show and this show. But the host isn't going to listen to all of that. Like they get like 15. It's not because they're a good or a bad person. There's just too many pitches. But they'll always click the YouTube video. Because the YouTube video is quick. It's like, boom, click. But what happens is if the pitch video and you're not in that video, it's not like, hi, I'm Brendan, have me on your show. Like, no, no, no. It's the value that you were going to share on the video anyways. So for me, the perspective is when I send a pitch to someone, uh, you can have me on the show. You cannot have me on the show. It's totally fine. But you should send my YouTube videos to your audience because they'll need it. And then the people who like that topic, they'll click the video and it's instant credibility. Whether the channel has 20,000 or two subscribers, does not matter? What matters is what's in the video. So my recommendation, it works all the time, is whenever you're pitching someone, keep the message short, but let the video do the pitching for you. That's the second thing. 
is include a video. So I would encourage people, if you're really serious about getting booked on shows, obviously you don't have to go crazy like me. I spent five figures on my production now, but I would say, you know, just make one video professionally. Like, like the gold, like what's the best stuff that you can share and put in one video. So for me, the one I send is like my five public speaking tips or something. Is so that, that the people... one that's the video that comes up as you go into your YouTube channel, is it? I think so. I think like it's that's got, daily... yeah, there's like, I don't know, 350 yeah. or more thousand yeah, views. On. Like so that. even just to see that, but it's good. It's actually good. The, the video that you have on that. Oh, thanks brother. But yeah, exactly. So that's the thing. Like for me, it's more about how do you lead with value? Because because the way you got to think with the pitch, Roy, it's a numbers game at the end of the day. Not everyone is going to like your topic, but what you want them to do is you want them to make a decision quickly. Okay, this is my topic. This is what it is. But if you're if the host is confused, you lose. If the host doesn't know what you're what you're going to talk about, you lose. Because they're not going to entertain a conversation. Go oh back and forth. They're already booked like uh, thick and thin. So that's that's my second piece of advice. So number one is pitch with the YouTube video. Second one is keep it short and sweet. And the third one is personalize the message, but not all the way. So what do I mean by this? If you personalize it too much, honestly, it takes a lot of time. So for me, my perspective is like personalize it enough where you stand out, but not enough to make it like a super personalized message in the sense that you can add the value for the person who add. So let's say you've had me on your show. So now it means like, okay, Roy's had me is the person who believes in me. I need to show up with all my energy, all my heart. I got to answer all of his questions and make sure I add as much value. But, and the people who say, no, I just don't worry about it. So the third piece is personalize it enough where the person feels special, but it's still a message that you can send multiple times. So I'll give an example. Obviously have the person's first name in the pitch, like Jesus, like that's like 101. So I'm going to mention the name of the podcast in the pitch. And the third thing is mention something specific in the podcast description that you just like. So for example, let's say I was pitching Roy, I would say something like, hey, I really like that your podcast is focused on speaking. There's not a lot of podcasts out there like that. And that's it. It's one sentence. And then I just go into my regular stuff. I'm the CEO of MasterTalk. I make YouTube videos on this. And then the last piece is just what's the value. Uh, I'm reaching out to help your audience navigate presentations online because of COVID. Here's my, and then I said, Boom, at the end, let me know if you want me as a guest. Totally fine either way. Hope you're staying safe and healthy. That's my pitch. Like, it's the same thing all the time. But I personalize those three things so it doesn't feel template And that's why I'm able to book so many shows. And, like, there's different platforms because we met on, I think, Matchmaker. And, uh, you know, now we, uh, you, know, you see uh, Podmatch is excellent. And I, I, I think that's it's so well that you can organize everything. But if you're like reaching out to somebody via email and you know that they've, you know, that it's just not a general, but you're like kind of realize, hey, this is a, would you have a few follow-ups or would you just send the email and let it go? Would you? So I think the smart people would do follow-ups. Personally for me, maybe that's just my ego. It's like, well, like I'll give you an example. I pitched uh, like the 100 really, really top shows, 0.5 percenters like yours is. Uh, this was excluding because yours was matchmaker, but for most people, it was like an email. And two of them said yes right away. So for me, it's more like, eh, the other 98 doesn't matter. Because like, if I just pitch 10,000, like there's 200.5 top like shows that will say yes anyway. So, and 200 is way too much for me to handle because I'm already busy. So it's like, so I, I, I'm a big fan of volume. So for me, output is the same thing. I don't like bothering hosts. Like I'm very respectful of other people's platform. So if somebody isn't sending you an email, I don't, I don't like worry about it because I know they're getting a lot of pitches. So I don't like to follow up personally, but uh, I don't recommend against it either. I think honestly, the easiest approach, because I've tried so many different things, is really just getting on Podmatch and getting on Matchmaker and just like, just spend the money, guys. Like it's not expensive. It's like, I, I think what, I spent 50 bucks on Podmatch so far. I've already booked 25 interviews. It's ridiculous. Like it's, it's nuts how many people have, have want to have me on their shows. If you know how to pitch correctly, you're paying two bucks an episode. Like it doesn't matter. Just suck it and uh, get on real shows and add value. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And even for the podcaster, like they've actually started monetizing. I mean, it's small money, but you actually end up making money. It used to be free. And I switched over because I just felt like getting so much value. Six bucks. And I see commission on two of the channels is like 20 bucks. So it's actually making, I mean, it covers one of the other monthly expenses, you know, because you're doing it anyway. And, you know, 
and just on the the pitching uh, like via email like I think I'm at six or seven thousand emails and I try to get it down I get it down to three thousand because I don't want to just delete the you know I want to try to go through there was time somebody would come back about the third time and it just because what happens is I look at it I go oh, that looks into and it just goes past a hundred so then I don't see it and it and so not to be rip you know sending it uh, like a day later or whatever but some people it's like a month later sorry and just wondering and it's sometimes it's the third hit that they get me and they get on the show so just for the bigger shows maybe it's worth uh, you know just come back and and you know maybe perhaps saying that you'd be on on so many shows and maybe like because pod match people can give uh, reviews for you even to give a screenshot of that because that's like saying podcasters are very happy with me Absolutely. I completely agree. But I would say that the bigger piece of advice, and, and I love what you shared there as well. Here, here's kind of the biggest thing, my biggest pet peeve with people pitching other people's shows, even if I don't have my own show, is if you've guested on less than 100 podcasts, you should be open to guesting on any show. So when I started guesting on a show, I wasn't like, oh, I have to be on Roy's podcast. I'd even like, I just said, I, I'm just going to say yes to everybody. I just want to meet human beings. I just want to practice my game. So the first hundred, I've probably done like 400 at this point. It's like ridiculous how many shows I've been on. But the first hundred, it was like not getting me business. It wasn't like about business. It was just me getting better and meeting people because I just love doing this. So like I was getting on weed shows, sports shows, like completely random that have like five downloads. But it was that momentum. So when I started landing bigger names, I was ready for those shows. So when they started asking me a lot of hard questions, I wasn't just like, uh, uh, like I was ready to pounce. But I think a lot of people, they're not patient enough because podcasting is a very long game, as you know. And because it's such a long game, it's five, 10 years, whether it's as a host or as a guest or both, we need to be willing to do the first hundred reps for free for nothing in return, just to make ourselves really good. Because the worst thing you want to do is you want to get booked on a big show and mess it up. That is really bad because if you do that, you don't get rebooked on that show, right? Or your your show doesn't go out. The episode doesn't go out. So for me, my advice always is if you're listening to this podcast right now, you've guessed on less than a hundred, you should say yes to everybody. I don't even care if the topic has nothing to do. I've been on every possible show you could think of ridiculous shows. I I had one show I was on a, it was called a weirdos.tv. It was the most bizarre show ever. They had me do like poems. The guy had just his face. You couldn't see his whole body. It was bizarre. And, and it was a great experience. So that when I started getting on bigger shows, I was ready. And I think that's what a lot of people don't think about is the reps are way more important than, than the actual reach that you get from one specific hit or one specific podcast. I think it's in Pakistan, there was um, a guy, uh, Rohan or Rehan Alawala is his name. And he was, he's helping a lot of people uh, create shows. He's trying to help them that they can basically start earning a thousand dollars a month, which would be great money there. And it, like there was young people reaching out to me loads. And I just said, yes, I was, I said, I do at least two a week. And then I started getting about 2% of my audience from that because like some might have, you know, 30 or something like that. I didn't mind. I just kind of done it, you know, and like that was one as well that like you're dealing with people that haven't got the experience. Some some were some were doing the research and asking lots of questions, but others were just having the conversation. And you know yourself, some people, they just kind of they just kind of sit there. They might just say something. So then it, it like it kind of got me to be, be able to just talk away because, you know, that they're struggling. And and there was times they had uh, IT problems, but I knew it was still recording. So I just talked away. Whereas a lot of people, I mean, you could be on a show and you just sit there and just kind of go, what's happening? You know, you kind of get to know which stream they, are, they, they, they all use. So you get to know, this is still recording. There's actually people live watching this. The guy is gone, but it's still recording. And you talk, and then afterwards, and they turn around to go, thanks very much. I, I could hear you, but I couldn't get back in. And, you know, and I think it's just by, as you mentioned, just keep doing it. And yeah, don't be looking at the, the num- because even even if it's like, say, uh, in America, whatever you go on a show and they might have, say, 20, 20, 30 uh, numbers is their downloads. But that could be the right people for you or somebody could share it that has a massive audience. You know, you just don't know. And 
I think, like I remember I, I got uh, David Icke on my show on The Awakening at an early stage. And I really appreciate him for it because like he was the ninth guest on the show. Like, you know, and I've seen him do other shows. Like he's been on shows with 10 million people view it, you know, on London Reel and everything. And I really respect him for actually, you know, when I was coming in, you know, so, and he's come on our show, the life, I think we've had him on about three times, you know, because... You know, we gave, and obviously I've done all my research and everything, but I, I respect people that do that. They don't kind of go, oh, like if anyone writes to me and they want to know the numbers, it's like, I'm not interested, right? Eh? Because then I know that they're coming from the wrong place. They're just coming uh, from, you know, you know it, it rarely happens, but when it does, yeah, they're not they're not the, the people that I want talking to my audience. There you go. I, I completely agree, man. I think that's the... That's a perspective I think a lot of people miss is that generally the best podcast guests in the industry are oftentimes the most generous. Oftentimes you'll find because they, they've just, they're just willing. I do the same thing. You do the same thing. We're just willing to talk. You know, it's just like help seven people. Sure. Whatever. Like I got an hour. Okay. Maybe in the future, like Gary V, I totally understand him. Like he just can't do that anymore. There's too much outbound. So he has, he has to look at the numbers, but for most of us, I mean, if we're, if you're listening, you're probably just getting started or you're an intermediate. So no excuses, definitely. Even for me, like to your point, like I, I mean, I don't think I've been on shows as big as I has, but yeah, definitely a couple of big ones, but you still, you still, if you have time for the smaller ones, you make the time until you just can't do it physically anymore. And just for those that are podcasting, because they think that you land the big boys and you'll get the million downloads. That's not like I've I, like with the speaking podcast, it's a, a, a 16 year old that was beatboxing is the number one, not David, Ike, you know, because I got him on. He was in Toastmasters. He had to join under his uh, under his father because you have to be 18 in Toastmasters. And I, I just found him so interesting and just pushing himself at that age. It was brilliant. And because obviously, you know, he wouldn't have been on other podcasts. He's really sharing it with his friends and everything. Whereas. David Icke doesn't, although he does, in fairness to him, he put it on the show. Some of them do put it on the show. But, like, we'd give the videos to a lot of different people. You don't, I don't track them numbers. I mean, we're, we're probably, we've, I'm sure, a couple of million of views on different shows that we've been on, but that we shared out on their channels. But I know I, I only track my own stuff. I, I don't uh, track their stuff. That's awesome. I love that. So, finally, I want to ask you a question of... Uh, you studied accountancy, yeah? I did. <laughs> Which I just want people to know. Sometimes people think you have to do what you study because <laughs> not all, that all, not always doesn't happen. And I know a lot of people, you know, they've, they've, they studied and realized, not, not for me. So I just want to know what happened with you. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, I am like the anti-communication coach. Super funny because... I grew up in Montreal in Canada and Montreal for those who don't know is a, is a city where you need to know how to speak French. So my whole life, I actually went to a French education system. That's why I speak English, French and uh, in Tamil, but I struggled my whole life because I was presenting in a language I didn't even know. And then when I got to college university, I was able to switch into English, but I studied accountancy. Like I wasn't a communications major. So let's like, let's kind of add all this up. So I, I spoke in my second language my entire life. I also have a broken left arm, right? That's tilted. So I had that when I was speaking and I was an accountancy major. And now I'm like a, a top end communication coach. So, so I think that the moral of that story, and that's why I'm so passionate about what I do and what we do, honestly, because we do pretty much the same thing, is, is really understanding that anyone can be a great communicator. You know, there's a quick quote from Kevin Durant that I always talk about with, with the people who really want to level up their game. And it's a quote I really believe in. And it is simply, hard work beats talent when talent fails to work hard, right? So hard work beats talent when talent fails to work hard. It doesn't matter how talented you are. If you don't have the output that comes with it, you won't get to the success that you're looking for. Like for me, it wasn't my, just my talent. It was really my output. I practiced so many times, podcast guesting hundreds of times. It's not just, I just appeared on a podcast and I knew what I was doing. The first couple of podcasts, I didn't even know you were supposed to have a headphone. I didn't even know that you need a mic. I just had a phone. I remember, I, I still remember it. I was calling somebody and the guy's like, don't you have like a, a, like a mic? I was like, what's a mic? And they were just like, it's 50 bucks, man. Just go buy a mic. And I didn't understand it. But, but that's the point is like, when we do the reps, we get really good. And then the other piece around doing what you love, what I would say, Roy, is focus always on asking yourself difficult questions about life every single day. 
So for me, I had my heart set up being an accountant, brother. I had no intention of doing this thing and like uh, being a YouTuber. You, you have too much energy to be an accountant. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I thought I worked at Price Waterhouse Coopers. It's like a big four accounting firm for those who don't know. And and I thought it was a water bottling company. That's how lost I was. I was like water house. So, so that's the thing. Like I had my eyes set on just staying at that company, working at an IBM, being a big time executive. But I just kept asking myself hard questions. And I read a book called The Thirst by Scott Harrison. He's like the CEO of Charity Water. It's a nonprofit he started with to help you with clean water. And there was a quote in the book that changed my life. And the quote was, the goal is not to live forever, but rather create something that will. So I really started to rethink my life. I was like, what am I creating in this world that will last forever besides being a big time executive at a company? And that's when I, I realized that I had a gift in communication. And that's what led to, to YouTube. I mean, when it started, it wasn't even a business, right? I was just making videos in my mom's basement. And people, if people don't believe me, go watch my first videos. And then it led into what it is today. Uh, they're very professional. So how did you break your hand? Yeah. So what happened essentially was when I was born, Roy, I was born upside down. So they had to cut my, uh, my, uh, the, my mom's stomach out to pull me out. And they didn't want to do that because it was going to risk her life. So they used a vacuum to pull me out. And that's what dislocated my, my, my arm. And it never, it never strained out. Not that it's a big deal, but I think the, the reason I mentioned that is because when I was a kid, like when I was five, six, seven years old, I had this big cast that I had to wear five, six years old, mostly. So imagine like I'm this five-year-old kid. I'm super shy. I got this big cast on, right? And I don't know how to speak French. So I can't make any friends, right? So it was really tough time for me. Obviously, I don't remember most of it because I was really young at the time. But luckily, because I was Canadian, a lot of of kids would come up to me and try and speak English to me and try and be friends with me. So it wasn't so bad. But I, I definitely understand where the anxiety comes from for most people. And, and that's why I guess I can speak on it so well in, in the context of YouTube anyways, around this podcast. Excellent. Excellent. Listen, Brendan, second time around, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. You might let people know how they can get in contact with you. Absolutely, Roy. Always a pleasure, brother. So two ways. The first one is Master Talk. Just go on YouTube, type those words, and you'll have access to hundreds of free videos on how to speak. And the second way, for those who are interested in coaching, just come to one of my free trainings. They do a free training over Zoom every few weeks. It's free, and you can register for that at rockstarcommunicator.com. Excellent. I'll make sure I put uh, the show notes, both the audio and the video. Thank you very much, Brendan. Thank you, Roy. So that's all for the Speaking Podcast. You'll find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. As mentioned, we're on BitChute and YouTube. I don't want to say subscribe and I'll do it like uh, Brendan says, smash that subscribe button. <laughs> Give us a thumbs up. And as he asked, maybe send a voice message how this has impacted you. Until next week, take care.